Um, I'm excited about our series, My Best Year Yet. Turn to your neighbor. All right, turn to your second choice and tell them it's going to be your best year yet. All right, man. Hey, listen, I believe that. I believe that. We're going to define what that looks like. We're going to talk about what that looks like. And to do that, we're going to use God's Word, okay? Y'all ready to jump into the Word this morning? Come on, come on. All right, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. When you get there, say, I'm there. All right. All right, it's going to be on the screen for you. Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 5, going through 8. Jesus talking to his disciples. He says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in but when you pray go into your room close the door and pray to your father who is unseen then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you and when you pray do not keep on babbling like pagans for they think they will be heard because of their many words do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you even ask let's pray God, we love you and we're so thankful for your word. We're thankful for the gift of prayer right now that we can talk to you right here, right now. God, I thank you for these incredible people. God, I thank you for this incredible church, Lord, that's called the Bridge Princeton. And God, I believe that it's gonna be our best year yet. And God, I pray right now over your word, God. May your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts this morning and transform us in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. A little bit about me. A little bit ago, a couple years ago, um, like probably I would guess many of you, I did not like Brussels sprouts. Yeah, man. They're slimy looking. They're gross looking. Um, they say they're good for you. I can't believe it back then. But then something happened. Something changed. Um, my wife made them. And I don't know what she did to them. But man, they actually tasted good. And now it's not like oh, I've got to eat this. It's like, oh man, I'm, I'm kind of craving that little Brussels sprout cranberry little thing that you do, Leah. Can you, can you make that? I look forward to the holidays. That's when she makes it. I'm actually, I have a craving for it. I, I really like it. It's actually one of my staples now at Thanksgiving. I love it. It's good. Now, what I'm about to say next may shock some of my beloved Eastern North Carolina people, and that's, you know, a couple years ago, I didn't like collards. Mm-mm. Kind of under the same category of Brussels sprouts, man. They, they stink, they're green, they're gross looking. I just didn't have nothing for them. That is until a couple years ago, my brother brought them to Christmas, and he said, hey man, listen, I know you don't like collards, but I put a little heat on them. I said, okay, I like hot food. I'll give it a shot. I tried it. I liked it. And as a matter of fact, it's one of my favorite staples. Now, I look forward to Brussels sprouts. I look forward to collard greens. And I'm like, who am I? Like, what is happening? Something has changed. Some kind of transformation has taken place. I don't get it. I don't understand it. Never would have thought. I always grew up like a meat and potatoes kind of guy. And now here I am eating these leafy greens. Like something changed and something did change. It was my taste buds. Yeah, my taste buds changed. Here's the crazy thing about your, your taste buds. They regenerate every 14 to 21 days. Isn't that crazy? So. That means that you can actively change your taste buds to enjoy healthier foods and like unhealthy foods less. Blew my mind. That's crazy. That's what happened to me. My taste buds changed. What I crave changed. So, guess what? If you want to enjoy new foods, you got to change your palate. You got to try some new stuff. And over time, you just might not like it. You might, you might not just like it, but you might actually crave it. You might actually desire it. That's the crazy part. Now, if we're honest, 
there's some things in our faith that are just kind of unpalatable. It's just kind of like, ah, I just, I just don't have a desire to do those things. Things like praying, things like fasting, things like reading our Bible. Listen, we know they're good for us, but we just don't maybe like to do them. We just don't have an appetite for them. We don't have a craving for them. We don't have a desire for them. Again, we know they would be good. We know that it might even be a game changer for us if we walked it out and we did them, but we just don't have the appetite for it. We just don't enjoy it. And you say, well, Pastor Luke, not me. Uh Uh-uh. No, I pray three times a day before every meal. Come on, Pastor Luke. I pray every meal. Every meal I pray. That's awesome. That's great. Um, However, surely that's not all prayer is good for. Surely Jesus didn't just lay down his life and raise it back up just so you could bless your Taco Bell. I mean, now don't get me wrong. That's a miracle. That's a miracle that God could bless Taco Bell or Krispy Kreme. Hey, don't sell them short now. That's a miracle. But I think there's more. I happen to think there's more in this relationship with God than just praying, students, that he helps you with that test you didn't study for. You know, I just, I just happen to believe that there's maybe more to this relationship with God than praying for your favorite basketball team to win. I just happen to believe that there is more in this relationship with God than giving you a good night's sleep. I believe that there is more. And for that reason, we are entering today in the 21 days of prayer and fasting. And, and we talked about it last week, and I don't know where you've settled it in your heart yet. If you're gonna be a part, it's not too late to start. I don't know where you're at. Maybe you decided, yep, I'm gonna do that, but I've been kind of dreading that day. Like, oh man, you've just been looking at the calendar all week. Oh, it's Friday, it's Saturday, I'm getting that much closer. Man, I don't know where you're at on that spectrum, but in this series, we're gonna be talking about some spiritual disciplines today. Prayer, talked about fasting, reading the Bible, and, and I don't wanna do these things just because they're things that we've done or because they're things we kind of feel like maybe we should do. No, no, I don't wanna do them just for the sake of doing them. Here's why. Because if every 14 to 21 days, you get new physical taste buds, we wanna take the next 21 days devote them to God, prioritize prayer and these spiritual disciplines that God has given us to develop new spiritual taste buds so that we begin to hunger for God even more. So that we're not just, we're not just kinda, you know, haphazardly walking through this life with Jesus, but no, we're asking God to renew our palate. We're asking God to give us a hunger. We're asking God to give us an appetite. We're asking God to give us a craving for Him and everything that involves him. So fasting, we kicked it off last week. It's anything given up temporarily to focus our attention on God. That can be considered a fast. That's what a fast is. Giving up of something so that you can spend more time in prayer with God, so you can develop this relationship with God. Fasting isn't about punishment. Nope, it's not about punishing your body. It's, it's not about you know, trying to um, earn God's approval. It's about preparation. Fasting is about training your body. It's about developing self-control. Fasting is about resetting your taste buds. It's about knowing God better and becoming more and more like Christ. Fasting is simply a tool. That's all it is. Fasting is a tool that pulls you away from the influence and desires of the flesh so that you can lean more into the influence of the Holy Spirit. So when you lean into the Holy Spirit, then your life will be blessed. I believe that when you lean into the Holy Spirit's guidance for your life, you're setting yourself up for your best year yet. You're setting yourself up for a year of blessings 
Oh, man, that sounds good, Pastor Luke. I've been needing a blessing. Yeah, I, I'd love to be blessed. Maybe a, a new job or, or, or more money or a bigger house or less stress or more opportunities. Is that what you're talking about, Pastor Luke? I don't know. Maybe. Um, it's okay to pray and ask God for those things. But if that's our definition of blessed, we're completely missing the point. True, lasting blessing is an intimate, active, thriving relationship with God. God, the one who created you. God, the one who works all things together for the, for the good of those who love him. I'm talking about God, the one who can give the spirit of wisdom to those who ask. I'm talking about God, the one who sacrificed his son for you and I to make us his children. I'm talking about a relationship with that true living God. That's what true blessing looks like, is walking hand in hand, step in step with God, a close relationship with God. And I said last week, the goal of fasting is this. The goal of fasting is to pray. You talk to God and he then talks to you. This conversation, communing with God, that's the goal of fasting. Hey, listen, if you're fasting, I'll say it again, and you're not praying, you are just on a diet. And my goodness, why would you wanna do that? That's crazy, right? If you're just fasting and you're not praying, you're not using that time to spend it with the Lord, then you're just on a diet. Prayer is the whole point of giving something up. You give something up in fasting so you can replace it with time with God. That's what it's all about. And in our text this morning, Jesus is speaking with his disciples. He's given them the Sermon on the Mount. And three times he says this, when you pray, when you pray, when you pray. See, prayer is not a matter of if, but when. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, the expectation there is not to have a prayer time, but to have a prayer life. And so Jesus, he's teaching his disciples here. He's not teaching them to pray. He's teaching them how to pray and how not to pray. So the expectation is there that you're gonna have this communication, this communion with God. That's what Jesus is looking at his disciples and saying like, hey guys, when you pray, when you pray, when you pray. We're in a season of fasting. And so we prioritize prayer on a whole nother level during this 21 days. You'll probably pray in these 21 days unlike the rest of the 344, okay? Um, so we're prioritizing prayer. That's why you abstain from certain actions and foods. And so let's talk about some things that Jesus prays about and ask his disciples to pray about. And I think what we'll see here, there's a little bit more to it than just food. By all means, bless your Chick-fil-A. But we got a whole list of other things that Jesus is saying, this is what my heart's concerned with. So let's look at it. Throughout the gospels, Jesus prays and instructs his disciples to pray for those who persecute you. Jesus says, pray for your enemies. Pray maybe for the people that you're in conflict with. Let that soak in for just a little bit. He says, pray for those who persecute you. And Jesus knows what's up ahead for himself and for these guys. And I can just only imagine that when the first church comes about in Acts and persecution becomes really real, that these words may be echoed through their brain as these folks try to chase them down and, and take their life because of their faith in Jesus. Jesus says, those people, pray for them. He said to pray that God's name be honored pray that God's kingdom will come, pray that God's will would be done. He says, pray that God would forgive us and pray that God would give us the power to forgive others. Pray to deliver us and keep us from temptation. Pray for God to send out workers into his harvest. Pray to drive out evil spirits. Pray for strength, pray for unity, pray for oneness. Jesus says, my heart and desire, God, is that they would be one as we are one, just as, as you are in me and I am in you, God. I pray that they would be one in us. Fasting and prayer, especially corporate fasting like we're jumping into is all about unity. He says, pray for healing. It's not a matter of if, 
but a matter of when. And God's line of communication is open 24 seven. This next part's important, guys, because 21 days of prayer and fasting can be a little bit dangerous, okay? Um, it can be a little bit dangerous, not necessarily to your health, but to your ego, okay? I want us to remember that prayer is not about impressing. Prayer is not about impressing people. Matthew 6, 5, and 7, Jesus says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, don't keep on babbling like the pagans, like the Gentiles do, because they think they'll be heard because of their many words. And so there's one person that Jesus describes in this passage, the hypocrite. Like, what does that mean? I think we kind of have an idea about what it means, but this is, what it, well, this is the heart of what it means. It means a pretender, an actor, an insincere person. So Jesus is saying, when you pray, be sincere about it. Mean it with your heart and don't do it for people. The hypocrites, he said, they love to be seen. They love for people to compliment them on their prayer. They, they love to have this perception that they're extremely close with God. And their aim is, is not to draw closer to God. Their aim is to draw people to themselves. And he said, that's their reward. Their recognition right there, that's their reward. He said, praying is not about impressing people. And listen, prayer is not even about impressing God. Because when we look at that other person or people in this text, the pagans, the Gentiles, this is what it says. When you pray, don't keep on babbling like pagans for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. The pagans focused on exactly how they delivered their prayers. They focused on repeating the right words in the right order. They often repeated the names of their gods as a way to get a blessing, the gods that they made with their hands, these idols. They think that they'll be heard by their many words, but prayer is not about impressing God. You can't do it. You, you can't impress God. God is not impressed by our praying, no. See, it's easy to slip into that mindset and to think you, you've got to earn that relational equity with God, but Jesus is the one that earned it. The reason you can talk to God is not because of anything you've done or I've done, it's because of the work of Jesus Christ. And so you can't impress God. And so finally, he's talking to his disciples. He says, hey, pray to be seen not by people, but by your Father. Private play, prayer pleases God because it, it shows the genuineness of your heart. And you're not tempted to impress anybody. And it happens to all of us, man. We get in prayer circles and, you know, a lot of the times we can't even think about what the person is praying about because we're so worried about what we're gonna say when it comes to be our turn. And that's a human nature thing, man. But what God is saying, what Jesus is saying right here, hey, listen, don't pray for people. Don't pray to impress people. Pray with an authentic, genuine heart to your God for people. Don't let it be about show. So does that mean no public prayer? Absolutely not. No, because see, it's not the activity that makes you prideful, but it's the intent of your heart. We pray all the time. We've already prayed corporately today. That's powerful. Jesus tells us to do that. As a matter of fact, when he gives the example right after this, he gives the Lord's prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. There's this sense of togetherness. It's important to pray corporately, but it's important that we have this personal time with the Lord as well. And it's important that our heart is targeting the Lord and not the applaud of other people. God doesn't need prayer 
we do. God doesn't need prayer. He wants prayer um, because he knows we need it, but God doesn't need prayer. No, it says in Matthew 6, 8, it says, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be like the pagans. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. You don't have to babble on. You don't have to use empty phrases and empty words. No, he already knows what you need before you even ask him, he knows. That's why you can't impress him because you're, you're not gonna shock him. God already knows. And so, okay, okay, all right, Pastor Luke. So if God already knows what I'm gonna ask, what's the point in even praying? It's a great question, glad you asked it. There's two reasons. One, God enjoys communion with his people. And prayer develops an intimate, personal relationship with God. I want you to hear those three words repeated three times in this text. When you pray, when you pray. It doesn't say, hey, when grandma prays, it doesn't say, hey, when mama prays. It doesn't say, hey, when pastor prays. No, it says, when you, disciple, you follower of Jesus, when you pray, when you pray. 1 Corinthians 1, 9 says that God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship. God called you, is calling you into fellowship. Hey, if you're here today and you haven't given your heart and your life to Christ, let me tell you his heart right now. His heart is for you to be in fellowship with him. He's calling you right now. God is calling you to be in fellowship with him. God called us into his fellowship. And Jesus tells us something very special. Jesus tells us to address God as our father. Now it's true that God can hear every single prayer of every single person. He can hear it. He's omniscient, he's all knowing. But it's only his children, those who believe in him through Jesus that can call on him as father. Jesus paints this picture of an intimate relationship with God, a relationship in which there's no point in trying to hide things. There's no point in trying to press, impress God. No, God is a father who is very, very in tune with the needs of his children. So that's part of the reason why we pray. The other reason that we pray is for our hearts to be changed and our minds to be changed. Consistent communion with God helps us to have the mind of Christ. It reminds us that it's only by Christ that we can have such communion with God. As humans, listen, we naturally pray selfish prayers, the things we care about. But when we fast and we pray, we tune our ear to what God is saying, not just to what our flesh is saying. We can pray in a way that's not just full of my fear and my selfishness and my flesh, but we can hear God better and we can start to pray God prayers. So again, the goal of fasting is to pray. I mean, it's funny how as you walk this relationship out with God, your prayer life matures. Listen, we're not all at the same place at the same time. No, it's a journey for each and every one of us. And I think sometimes that's what makes it hard for us to stand in a circle to pray because sometimes we're standing in front of what seems like spiritual giants, people who've been following Jesus their whole life. And the last thing we wanna do is us lift our voice and pray because we feel like maybe somebody will judge us. But let me tell you something, hey, God loves to hear you pray. And you are fully capable of doing that. I don't know who needs to hear that this morning, but God wants to hear your voice. Yeah, there's some incredible people and you hear their prayers and they're eloquent and they're nice and they're sweet and it's great. But I wanna tell you, listen, God wants to hear from your heart. And that's the goal of fasting, is to pray, to commune with God. And Jesus, he gives us this example in Luke 18, nine through 14. The spirit and the attitude in which we pray matters. And he gives us this example in Luke 18, nine through 14. It says, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, 
I thank you that I'm not like other people. I thank you that I'm not like robbers. I thank you that I'm not like evildoers, that I'm not like adulterers, or God, even like this tax collector. God, I thank you that I'm nothing like him. God, I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. But then the scene shifts. The camera pans to this tax collector, and, and we see his prayer, and this is what Jesus says he prays in this parable. It says, the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast, a sign of sorrow, and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. And Jesus gives this important truth, this important principle that was important for his disciples, but is just as important for us today. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. I, I just can imagine the shock on the people's faces, maybe his disciples' faces, the, the crowd around Jesus as he tells this parable. And he says, there's a Pharisee and a tax collector. And already in their mind, they're like, wow, what are they doing even remotely close? We got a man of God over here, the Pharisee, and we got this tax collector, this traitor to our people. What are they doing in the same room? And Jesus continues to tell this story. And, and Jesus concludes this story by saying that it was the tax collector who was justified. The only one justified in this story. And that word justified, it means God's act of declaring people not guilty of sin. I can imagine the shock on their faces. Well, wait a minute, this guy's a Pharisee and, and he's a tax collector. And Jesus says it's a matter of the heart. Only the tax collector recognized his sin. The Pharisee believed himself to be righteous, to be good. And so he ended up leaving no different than when he came. The tax collector though, though he was sinful, has gone home justified. Much like the hypocrite in Matthew 6, the Pharisee in Luke 18 shows the true intent of his actions to gain the approval of others. His appetite, his craving, his desire, his public recognition is exalting himself, lifting himself up. That's what his appetite is for, his hunger is for. And my question for us this morning is, what are we hungry for? What do we have a craving for? What do we have an appetite for? Our own personal success, our own personal prosperity, our, our own fame, what are we hungry for? Jesus is saying these, these words right here. Hey, listen, if you wanna hunger for the things that really matter in this life, I can help you. If you wanna hunger for the things that really truly matter in this life, follow me. If you're just joining us, maybe you've just come in the last couple of weeks or, or maybe months, you know, I just wanna share a little bit about the heart of our house, the vision of this church, the, the vision of the bridge is to change lives that change the world. And here's the truth. This is what I believe in my heart. I believe that we're not waiting for God to move. I think he's waiting for us. I believe that God is waiting for us. I, mean, I believe God is ready to reach our families. I believe that God is ready to, to reach our children. I believe that God is ready to reach our city, our community. I believe God is ready to reach our state and country. I believe God is ready to reach this world. The question is, are we ready? I think our very first step is to check our ego at the door. Let me not believe that I can change a single life if my life hasn't been changed. The purpose of the fast is this. I've given you the goal. The goal of the fast is to pray. The purpose of the fast is this. Lord, change my life so that we can change the world. I believe if we do that first part, that second part will happen. Jesus, he gives us that command to go and make disciples of every nation. He wouldn't tell us to do it if we were not able to do it, but he gives us the power of his Holy Spirit 
And so that's why we just wanna humbly come before God and just say this morning, hey, listen, this is not my life, this is your life, God. May your spirit guide me, may your spirit lead and direct me, may your spirit guide and direct this church so that hurting people can know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. A few questions that I think though we have to ask ourselves as we jump into this fast, because today's the first day. I'm asking myself these very same questions and I think we have to ask ourselves these questions right here. What are my blind spots? What are my blind spots? What are the areas in my life that I don't even know need to change? What are the areas in my life that I don't even know need to change because I'm just not self-aware? Because I don't see it. Where are my blind spots, God? Where are they at? And God, what areas of my life do I have deaf ears? What are the areas of my life that maybe my pastor or my friends or my family or my coworker, they keep trying to tell me about myself, but at this point, it's not a blind spot anymore. I've just got deaf ears, I don't hear it anymore. I don't see, I don't have eyes to see this blind spot and I also don't have ears to hear when people try to confront me about it in a loving way. And then finally, what part of my heart is hard? Not a blind spot, not deaf ears, but what part of my heart is hard? Where is their pain? Where is their trauma? Where is their callousness as a result of being hurt? What part of my heart is hard?